So my name is Sanjeev, S-A-N-J-I-V is my first name, last name Chopra, C-H-O-P-R-A. I'm a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. I have also, in addition to practicing medicine, and my specialty is hepatology, liver disease, I've carved out a parallel second career in speaking and writing. So I've been fortunate enough to have traveled to about 105 countries and I've given talks on many, many topics outside of medicine. And I've written books about those on leadership, on happiness and living with purpose, invitation to good health, the top stories in medicine in the last century Then I predict what will happen in the next 25 years. So I'm always learning. I'm always inspired by my colleagues, by my patients, my students, my friends. Uh, every single day, I, I feel inspired by something they've said or done. So I've been very fortunate, very blessed to have found my purpose in life. And we can talk more about that. Mark Twain, the famous author once famously said, the two most important days in your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. So each one of you listening, you have a singular purpose in life and you'll find it. And when you live it, you'll be happy amongst the happiest people on this planet. So uh, I work hard. You know, there's a saying, success is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. You've heard the saying, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Luck is preparedness meeting opportunity. So in medicine, there's a... <laughs> electronic textbook. Most textbook of medicine are 6,000 pages. This one is more than 100,000 pages and it's called up to date. It's updated literally every two weeks. Otherwise the traditional textbook of medicine comes out in print and by the day it comes out, it's already one or two years outdated. Medicine advances in such a rapid pace people who wrote the chapter 10 months ago, then it went to the printer, then it came back for proofreading by the editors, sub-editors. So this one is updated every two weeks. It's called Up to Date. It was conceived by my brilliant late friend, Dr. Burton Rose, a kidney specialist at Harvard Medical School. We worked together for many, many years. And he unfortunately passed away pretty young, around 75 years of age. But he was called the Steve Jobs of medicine. People even nominated him for the Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine. Changed the way patient care occurs around the world. Up to date is now subscribed to by 2 million physicians in 195 countries. And I'm very privileged and fortunate from the very inception to be the editor in chief of the hepatology section the liver section of up to date. I recruited 200 of my renowned colleagues from around the world to contribute, and I also contribute, but we have a system where it gets updated on a regular basis. So that's a little bit about me. 
I've been married to a brilliant classmate of mine from my medical school who became a pediatrician and now teaches meditation. And I have three kids. And from my middle daughter, I have two granddaughters. And they are the joy of my life. They live in New York. We live in Boston. They're coming on tomorrow, Friday, they're coming for four or five days. It's going to be so much fun. Well, we thank you for joining us. And uh, you guys, if you haven't already checked out, I put the link in the chat for Dr. Chopra's book, The Two Most Important Days. It's a wonderful read, very, uh, very easy read, very inspirational stuff. Definitely check that out. But uh, Dr. Chopra, do you mind if we jump into student questions? While sure, we sure, it? absolutely. No. Okay, this, our first uh, question comes from our friend Raul. Raul, you can unmute. You had a pretty good question for Dr. Chopra. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, it really is great to be here. Let me tell you that my um, my top university, right, the one which I, I've always wanted to go there is, is Harvard University. So I, I really look up to you um, and I'd love to go there. So, so my question is, how can we ensure that medicine is delivered to undeveloped countries and, and also to areas of the world which have been struck by a natural disaster? That's a great question. So, you know, if, if people go into medicine, they can carve out different kinds of careers. One can be a clinician, one can be a researcher, one can be the CEO or president of the hospital or the hospital change. One can be an author, a speaker, innovator. And the last one is public health. And to me, the people who go into public health are some of the greatest heroes in medicine. They want to change the world. They want to create health access. They want to create health equity. I had a colleague, Dr. Paul Farmer, and he was actually my medical student in 1991. He graduated from Harvard Medical School together with Jim Kim, another student. And they were a little older than the rest of the class because they had done a degree in medical anthropology. And as medical students, they started partners in healthcare. And Jim Kim worked for 17 years, then he became president of Dartmouth. Then he was stabbed by President Obama to lead the World Bank. But Paul Farmer continued the work. There's a wonderful book written about him by Tracy Kidder, three times Pulitzer Prize winner. It's called Mountains Beyond Mountains, The Quest of Dr. Paul Farmer, A Man Who Would Cure the World. There's a beautiful documentary called Bending the Ark. Paul Farmer, at age 62, he had provided the most seminal care for the poorest of the poor, the most destitute in Rwanda, in Peru, in Haiti, in Russian prisons, prisoners with multi-drug resistant tuberculosis in America, in Native American reservations. At age 62, all day he's seen patients in Rwanda goes to sleep and dies of a heart attack. Jim Kim, his colleague and classmate, flew to Rwanda with his family to bring Paul's body back to Miami, where he had grown up very poor in an old school bus. We had a wonderful celebration for Dr. Farmer at the medical school and the head dean, George Daly said, Paul Farmer will go down as the greatest humanitarian of our time. And then he said, Paul Farmer was my mentor. For the head dean to say that of a student. So if you want to, look at equity and uh, distribution of good medical services around the world. Read about Paul Farmer's work. He has received millions of dollars in awards and plowed them into his foundation. True saint of a man. So mountains beyond mountains, the quest of Dr. Paul Farmer, a man who would cure the world. And then the documentary, Bending the Ark. I think what will also help in the future is one of the biggest stories in medicine and biological sciences, actually in life right now. And that is artificial intelligence. 
a better name for which is aided intelligence, augmented intelligence. And we can incorporate AI in addressing health inequity, in providing care, in cutting down medication errors, in doing lots and lots of things. You've all heard of Chat GPT. It's changing the world. Bill Gates said recently, Chat GPT is changing the world. Uh, today, I made four new slides on a talk I give around the country as a keynote uh, on Chat GPT. Uh, and it's going to keep evolving. And it's not the only game in town. Google has its own, China has its own, Korea has its own, India may have its own. Uh, it's going to be an amazing way we live in the future. The question is, can we address morality? Can we address ethics using a computer? It will still need human beings. I think it'll be a unique partnership. It's very interesting. We had a guest speaker yesterday who is the former vice president of Google's artificial intelligence. He mm -hmm. was one of the trailblazers with that, um, uh, Rajan Sheth. So uh, moving on, one of our students texted me uh, one of the questions and they wanted to know in your book, um, and, and I want to know this as well, you talk about experiences versus objects being the source of happiness, according to some, some of the studies. Can you, uh, by yeah, chance- so All the research has shown that if somebody wins the lottery, I actually know a gentleman who used to work as a doorman in a big store. And together with a colleague of his, the two of them, bought an $8 scratch ticket and they won $20 million. So $10 million each. But he's an amazing individual and he's been given good advice by some of us and he's held on to that advice. And the advice is, and the research shows that people who win 10 or $20 million in a lottery, a year later, most of them are less happy than they were before they won the lottery. Some of them even say, I wish I had never bought that ticket. Now, why does that happen? They waste it, they plunder it, they gamble it away. Some of their friends, distant friends, associates come out of the woodwork. How did you get so lucky? Pay for my mortgage. The only ones who are happy are who, those who partake in meaningful experiences. This gentleman I'm talking about, for the first time in his life, got a passport, started traveling abroad, helped his mother and sister, donates 10% of his wealth to charity. So if you partake in meaningful experiences and donate a certain amount, and it's usually around 10%, to a charity of your choosing, then you're happy. Otherwise, okay, you buy a luxury car, you move into a huge house. After three months, six months, it's a car, it's a vehicle. Yes, you still enjoy it, but you don't enjoy it as much as you enjoyed it the day you got it or the day you moved into a brand new mansion. This phenomenon is called hedonic adaptation. You've heard the term hedonism. Many of us are on this hedonic treadmill and it will not give you lasting happiness. It will give you short-lived happiness. There are four keys to happiness. The first one is having a cadre of good friends. Your friends are your chosen family. Robert Louis Stevenson said, a friend is a gift you give to yourself. The longest standing study on happiness is still ongoing. Can you think of a study that's gone on for 80 years? Participants die, principal investigator dies, others come, they pass away, funding disappears. This started a year before Hitler invaded Austria and they recruited 750 21 year olds, 250 went to Harvard and the other 500 were from very poor dysfunctional parts of Boston and they followed them. Off they went to the war, they came back, re-entered into the study. Detailed questionnaires, physical examination, blood tests, EEG, cholesterol, MRIs. 
cohort of their children, 2,000 are being followed in a similar study. Who was in that group? What happened to them? Became teachers, lawyers, doctors, four ran for the US Senate. One became America's president, John F. Kennedy was in that cohort. And what is the major conclusion of the study? After eight years of research, loneliness is toxic. Loneliness is toxic. And your satisfaction with the relationships with friends, even at age 50, is a better predictor of health, happiness, and longevity three decades later at age 80. Better than what? Your blood pressure, your electrocardiogram, your blood tests. So the first tenet for us to be happy is having a small cadre of good friends. James Rohn, best-selling author, once said, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So choose your friends carefully. The ones who have similar core values, not those who drink too much, gambling, drugs, then we will gravitate and become like them. The second attribute of the happiest people on this planet is the ability to forgive. Gandhi once said, the weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. The Buddha said, resentment is like holding a hot coal with the intent of hurting it at somebody who offended you. That person's moved on. Meanwhile, you're burning your hand. But to me, the, one of the greatest examples of forgiveness is that of Nelson Mandela, who was incarcerated in prison for 27 years. 27 years. He's released. Mr. Mandela, do you harbor resentment against your captors? He said, I have no bitterness. I have no resentment. Resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill my enemies and only kill you. So forgiveness, friends, forgiveness. What's the third? Wonderful quote by Albert Schweitzer, who was a physician, theologian, humanitarian, Nobel laureate. Talk about modesty. In 1952, he gets the Nobel Peace Prize. And at the ceremony, he says, now I have to go earn it. Now I have to go earn it, as though I'm not deserving of it. And he once said, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I'm certain of, the ones amongst you who will be truly happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. There's this whole concept now of servant leadership. It is in the giving that we receive. Beautiful quote by St. Francis of Assisi. So I've distilled it into three F's for happiness, friends, forgiveness, for others. What's the fourth one? It begins with G. And you know it. It's gratitude. One of the easiest ways for us to increase our happiness level is to have a gratitude journal. I do a workshop with an amazing spiritual intellectual friend of mine. And we give everyone a notebook with their name. Gratitude journal. Once a week, even if you do it once a week, let's say on Sunday evening, as you're reflecting on what's in store for you this coming week, look back at the week that transpired and write down what you should be grateful for. Your happiness quotient will go through the roof. Study, randomized study done by Robert Emmons. It's considered one of the fathers of modern positive psychology. He's written a wonderful book, paperback, called Thanks, How the New Science of Gratitude Can Make You Happier. All right, so three Fs, friends, forgiveness for others, and gratitude. It's all low tech, and it's so doable for all of us. But in order for us to have sustained happiness, because happiness is more than the sum total of happy moments, we have to find our purpose and live it. And down the road, you'll find your purpose. They're young people. They're people in their 17 years of age, 19 years of age, who found their purpose in life with an experience they had. 
And they thought they'll start small. And before you knew it, it became a life calling. I've met these people. I write about them. And, and you can see the bliss in their face. They are the happiest people on this planet. Okay, what else? It's just absolutely life changing. <laughs> so <laughs> wonderful, wonderful stuff. You guys are getting a, a amazing, amazing lesson here. Um, we'll go with a few more student questions and we'll let you go because we know it's getting kind of late for some. No, no, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story about Papa Jaime, whom I met uh, 15, 18 years ago at a leadership course at the Kellogg School of Management. And he's from the country, Colombia. And his name is Jaime Aramillo. But his name is Papa Jaime because he's a national hero. And he's now about 70 years of age. At age 28, he's standing at a street corner in Bogota. And across the street, there's a sewer. And these orphans live there in the dirt and the muck. And he's saying, you know, I should try and help these kids. A beautiful seven-year-old girl emerges. She's looking at him and smiling. As they're having this interchange, a car comes around the corner, stops in the middle of the street, a window rolls down, somebody tosses a toy, Fisher Price toy, yellow school bus. The car recedes. The girl comes running to the middle of the street, beaming with joy, in the middle of the road, looking at Jaime Aramillo. She's never possessed a toy. And tragically, tragically, as they're having this interchange, speeding truck comes around the corner and kills her. And he says to himself, this is it. I'm going to help these kids. This is my calling in life. He is adopted, house, schooled, fed, educated, 60,000 orphans, Papa Jaime. So I said, Papa, how many staff do you have? How do you pay for it? Sanjeev, I have a staff of 150. I have a bakery. The only thing we make is cookies. I've convinced the restaurants in Medellin, Bogota to have a cookie jar next to the cash register. As people are leaving, they grab a cookie. Next to it is a shoe box with a slit. They drop change. I get 50% of my needs that way. I said, what? wow. 150 staff. I said, what about the other 50%? Said, oh, I'm a motivational speaker. I get invited to speak all over Latin America. I plow my own rear into the foundation. I said, Papa, come on, that doesn't cut it. I know what motivational speakers get. So he smiles, he says, you're right. Sanjeev, every time I need money, out of the blue, somebody helps me. He says, I'll give you an example. Three weeks ago, I needed 41,000 US dollars to pay my bills. So I go to three banks and they turn me down. Papa, you already got loans with us at the lowest rate. Don't even tell anyone, but we can't give you more. So he's coming back to the office and there's a street woman across the street. He's a national hero. She recognizes him. She says, Papa Jaime, crosses the street and gives him a hug. And he turns to her and he says, are you hungry? Come, 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 come to the office. So she's in his office having coffee and cookies. He's on the phone calling three other bankers, and she can tell he's being turned on. So she looks at him and she says, how much money do you need? I said, Sanjeev, I told her I need 41,000 US dollars. She looks at him, smiles, and says, I give it to you. I said, Sanjeev, I said to myself, she's cuckoo, the street woman. She opened her purse, she had $60,000. Her son had sent her the money to get off the street, move into a home. She had to go to a bank, deposit it, sign a piece of paper. She says, I've saved some other money. The weather's good. I can move later. You need it. Your children need it. Take it now. No questions asked. You can return it if you want, when you want. So that kind of thing happens to me. His children have become, grown up to become computer scientists, teachers, lawyers, doctors, surgeons, showed me the photograph of a young man dressed in impeccable white, black with a tennis racket in his hand, flanked by Pete Sampras on one side, Agassi on the other, national junior champion of the country, Colombia, in tennis. And many of them are giving back to the foundation. But he found his purpose in life <clears throat> some 40 years ago, witnessing the death of that beautiful seven-year-old girl. 
You know, the Buddha once said, every life has a measure of sorrow. Sometimes it is this that awakens us. Adversity is a gift. In every adversity is the seed of greater success. You and I will face adversity. One of the things I would encourage you to do, so who are the most successful people? The people who are happy. We talked about the four happiness traits. Albert Schweitzer, Nobel laureate said, success is not the key to happiness. Happiness is the key to success. So that's number one. Number two is having grit. Grit is passion and perseverance for a long-term articulated goal. I urge you to watch a TED talk by Angela Duckworth on grit. She's done research all over, students, managers, lawyers, West Point graduates, the ones who have grit, they are very successful. Grit can be defined as having passion and perseverance for a long-term articulated goal. I would also urge you to make your goals in life. Take a notebook, call it your goals in life, and put down your professional goals. At this stage in your career, your students, you're very focused on that. He wants to get into Harvard. He'll do it. If he has that goal, professional, and next to it, an action plan, right? A vision without a plan is a hallucination. So you gotta have an action plan. You can't just daydream, oh, I'll get into UCLA, Harvard, Harvard Medical School, I'll become a dean, I'll write so many books. You have to work at it. So grit and happiness are the two, I think, key elements for us to have success. Let's define success. Success is a journey. It's not a destination. Success is the progressive realization of a worthy goal. Progressive realization of a worthy goal. Who's it worthy for? You. If you're doing it to impress your mom, your dad, your teacher, your neighbor, your friend, your sibling, in the long run, it may not work. It has to resonate for you. So when you make your goals, write them down. Have an action plan. Ideally, we have goals, professional, physical, social, family, spiritual, financial, all the different aspects of our life. And you should make your goals in those. But at different stages in your life, different goals will be more paramount. Right now, it's to become a good student, get into a good college, get a job, get a career, find a calling. All that will happen, but you gotta write them goals. And I call it the STAR principle. So S is specific. You can't say, one of these days, I want to get into a pretty good college. That's so vague, right? I want to get into Harvard or whatever. That's specific, time bound by which year. A is to aim high. Don't sell yourself short. Thoreau once said, if you have built castles in the air, your work need not be lost. That is where they should be. Now go put the foundations underneath. Michelangelo once said, the greater tragedy for most of us is not that we aim too high and fall short. We aim too low and reach the mark. And Walt Disney once said, whether you believe you can do a thing or believe you cannot, you're right. Capacity is a state of mind. So specific, time-bound, aim high, and the R in the star has to resonate for you, has to be relevant to you. Don't do it to impress somebody. If you follow those principles, you write down your goals, you'll be amazed at how nature will support you. There's a book written by a professor from Yale which I read 30 years ago. It's called What They Don't Teach You at Harvard Business School. What a great title. And uh, I think the story is there. I've been unable to verify it, but the story is that the 
graduating class in Yale Business was asked, how many of you have written down your goals? 3%. How many of you think of your goals on a regular basis? 14%. So 17% in the awareness or they've written it. The other 83% are cruising around. He caught up with them 20 years later. The 17% who had written their goals or thought about them on a regular basis, you know, all the subjective parameters in life, being happy, feeling fulfilled, having good friends, were higher. And their combined income of the 17% was greater than the combined income of the other 83%. Just writing your goals. So write your goals, have an action plan, and, and think big. There's a book written in the 1930s, The Magic of Thinking Big. All these amazing books are uh, absolutely brilliant. Become a better storyteller. One of the talks I give is called How to Give a Good TED Talk. What are the principles of public speaking? The better a public speaker you are, the more success you'll have in life. <clears throat> No matter what profession, Steve Jobs once said, the most powerful people in the world are storytellers. The most powerful people in the world are storytellers. You and I can all improve our storytelling. Uh, watch good TED Talks. Watch good commencement speeches. J.K. Rowling's commencement speech at Harvard is one of the most brilliant. Robert Waldinger a colleague, amazing guy, professor of psychiatry at Howard Med School, also Zen monk, has given a TED talk, what makes a good and happy life, the longest standing study on adult happiness. This is the study I mentioned earlier. He's now the principal investigator. It's the number one TED talk given by a physician. Number one TED talk, brilliant. You can learn so much um, from people. Uh, these are brilliant people out there. And, and we're lucky we live in this age. You know, when TED started, you'd have to go somewhere in California and probably pay $25,000 a ticket. And now you can access it free. Each one of you down the road, I want you to do something. Write a book. You've got at least one book in you. If you're passionate about something, a story you can tell and give one TED talk, one TEDx talk, you'll be able to do it. Make that one of your goals. Sir, I have to say, this is honestly, this is, I know this is life changing stuff for many of these kids here as they go off into the world and kind of figure out what they want to do and what kind of people they want to be and what kind of lives they want to lead. Um, so uh, before we let you go, is there any advice that you could give to these kids as they kind of figure out what they would like to do with their lives? Yeah, I think think big, uh, see what resonates for you, write down your goals, be prepared for adversity. It will happen to most of us. And then if you rebound from it and you're resilient, you'll be even, even stronger have a good core group of friends. You know, you could form a club with four or five friends, call it the mastermind club and meet once a month and start by saying, are you facing a challenge? And then go around the room and your friends will come up with amazing solutions. They'll be there to help you. But who knows, you may launch a company, you may start a nonprofit, you may start something to help the poor. You may become a teacher for kids your age who are not going to school, unable to go to school, can't afford school. There's so many things uh, in life and always lead by example, always lead by example. The story of Gandhi, Gandhiji is sitting in his ashram and his mother walks eight months in the dust in the heat with her 12 year old son. She says, Gandhiji, look at, my, look at my son. He's gained a lot of weight. He's eating a lot of sugar. Would you please tell him not to eat sugar? He adores you. He worships you. He'll do anything for you. Gandhi says, come back in a week. So off they go. A week later, they walk eight miles in the dust and heat. 
Gandhi looks at the boy, he says, son, don't eat sugar. It's not good for your health. And the boy says, Gandhiji, from this moment onwards, I've given up sugar. And he leaves the room. And the mother stays behind. She turns to Gandhiji and she says, Gandhiji, thank you for saying that to my son. But can I ask you a question? He said, sure. We were here a week ago. You could have said the same thing to my son then. And Gandhi whispers into her ear. At that time, I had not given up sugar. <laughs> right? It's not, you have to teach by example. It's not do as I say, it's do as I do. That's what the greatest leaders do. He couldn't tell the boy not to give up sugar till he had proven to himself that he could give up sugar. It's a great story. So start telling stories, read a lot. The person who does not read, I put this on Facebook a couple of years ago. The person who does not read has no advantage over the person who cannot read, right? And one of my friends, uh, he's top banker in this area. He called me the next day and he said, you know, Sanjeev, I used to read a book every week. Last three years, I haven't read a book. You put me to shame. <laughs> I'm reading a book every week now. Thank you. So read, broaden your horizons, think big, uh, learn new stuff. For people going into medicine, I say microbiome, the 100 trillion bacteria in our gut, second human genome, artificial intelligence, CRISPR and gene editing, messenger RNA, and believe it or not, the psychedelic revolution. These are five of the biggest stories in medicine right now. And if you're going into medicine, I tell the medical students, whether you go into neurology, rheumatology, endocrine, liver, GI, study these. Publish in basic sciences or clinical research and your career will take off. Explore. Absolutely wonderful advice, sir. And we can't thank you enough for spending time with us today. Um, before we let we let you go, before I end the meeting for all, traditionally, I, I allow the students to thank our guests and then I'll end the meeting for all. And we'll have a recording sure. uh, shared out for everyone who missed this, or if you guys would like to watch it again. Can we all uh, say thank you to Dr. Chopra for taking his time out of his day to talk to us today? Thank you so much, sir. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. 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 I, I give 75 bucks a year, but I'm the happiest when I'm with young people. And you are wonderful, mm -hmm. sir. You are Thank the you. future. You are the future. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.